Hello and welcome back to another interview at the side event. This side event is hosted by Apta and Hero. Uh, this one is focusing on AI and Web3 and is in conjunction with uh, Future Blockchain Summit. Uh, we are here with Shiram, who just did a massive, a really nice presentation. Uh, Shiram, thank you for your time. And uh, please tell us a little bit about, just for the audience sake, tell us a little bit about who you are and what you're doing at the company. Perfect. So I'm the CEO of APTA. Uh, we're a, a company based out of the University of Cambridge. Essentially, we notice a big problem in the uh, AI research field, especially around conversational models. And it's the fact that these models can't reason. And we know that's something that some of the biggest companies in the world are realizing right now. Right. So what we're doing is we're trying to build the next paradigm of conversational AI. Right. AI that can handle lots of different data types, which are currently not accessible by LLMs, mm. and also AI that can reason. So it can give you more robust and accurate responses to questions. I I really enjoyed your presentation today, and I think the timeline of events that you showed was really, really um, uh, informative. What I wanted to ask as well was that um, it, it seemed to me that only recently um, AI discovered the agentic flow. Could you walk us through what that is, and for the audience who may not know what that is? So basically, the whole point is large language models have a very good grasp of language. That's it. They can't reason. They work by predicting the next word. So in agentic flow, we don't let the LLM do everything. We don't let it do the heavy brain work. Instead, we use the LLM simply as the, you know, the ears and the mouth of our system. So in agentic flow, the LLM is used to understand the intent of the user. Right. And that's it. It breaks it down into tasks. And those tasks, like heavy cognitive lifting, is not done by the LLM. It's done by distinct agentic functions. These are deterministic models, which are robust and accurate. They don't just make the next word up. Uh, and then at the end of the process, we pass it back to an LLM, and then it you know, converts those answers into nice conversational responses. So through agentic flow, you get two sides of the coin. You get the intuitiveness of conversing with technology, which is what LLM provide, mm -hmm. but then you also get the robustness and accuracy that you get from deterministic agentic models, which are actually designed to do a task. And how come, why is it that it came to be that uh, only recently this was discovered? It seemed like this would have been a logical, logical next step in, 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 the, in the realm of AI. Why is it? So I think uh, first was we wanted to get LLMs adopted in, in business settings and people started to use them. Right. And with classic any technology adoption curve, people start using the technology for what it's designed for and they start to encounter problems downstream. And that's exactly what happened. Mm. When people started to use LLMs to deal with charts, diagrams, mm. structured databases, numerical information, they realized the pitfalls of the technology. Mm. And that's what triggered the field to think about the next big thing. But mm. this is not something that hasn't been mentioned before. Mm. One of the you know early pioneers of AI, Jan LeCun, has been talking about this problem for years, ever since LLMs came out, right. that we're trying to expect two much from them mm. but often at the start these visionaries are small voices in a large crowd mm. and essentially as more and more people started to use this technology they've started to see the pitfalls and that's why it's only about now and even still not now i feel like agentic flows aren't going to become a big thing in the next year or two years mm. everyone is still stuck in the lm era but mm. As with all technology, you've got to start early, and I think this is the perfect time to start. Yeah, yeah. And and one last thing on on um, the the adoption curve. I, I had a question on where do you think we're at in the adoption curve? So you mentioned that uh, it seems like everybody seems to be using ChatGPT, um, daily life, even for personal. So where do you think we're at on the adoption curve? So we saw this with the cloud computing era, but essentially. I think we're getting to the same inflection point with AI, where often the first movers uh, in the industry are the infrastructure providers. These are the companies like OpenAI, Meta, AWS, CoreWeave. They're providing the core AI infrastructure that everyone will build on top of. Right. That We're now at the stage where that market is established with key players. I think the key players are OpenAI, Anthropic, you know, um, Mistral, uh, all, these, all these players. What's where we're at now is how people take these foundational models and build the application layer on top. These are vertical focused use cases for those models that actually end users interact with. So we've all seen chat GPT and stuff, great for surface level tasks, great for text-based workflows. That's okay for like everyday tasks, but in businesses you need deep capabilities. And that's where these application layers are gonna come out. I think that's where now the next 10 to 20 unicorns are gonna come. How can I build on that foundational AI technology? and build that application layer on top. Fantastic. Well, we've got a lot a lot to learn in this space and there's so much more to come. It seems like we're only scratching the surface. Absolutely. We're always scratching the surface. We're always there. <laughs> Shrom, I want to thank you for your time. Very insightful. Cheers. All the best. Thank you so much for watching. Hope you found this insightful. We'll leave all the links in the description. Thank you again and we'll see you next time. Cheers.